My name is Elaine Storkey and I'm an academic, a writer and a broadcaster and welcome to my seminar at Spring Harvest. The seminar is called Women in a Patriarchal World and it's about the Bible. Especially it's about the way in which the Bible presents women and it raises some questions and answers some critics. And I think it's a very important topic because there's a lot of criticism of the Bible in terms of how it sees women. A typical critic would say something like this, that the Bible is a very patriarchal document. And by that they mean it was written mostly by men, for men. And it echoes the patriarchal, the male-dominant nature of society in which it was written. Now societies have been patriarchal throughout history, and of course many today are extremely male-dominant and have very strong ideas as to how women should live and very strong rules for constraining their movements. In parts of Pakistan, for example, if a woman is seen talking to a man to whom she is not married or isn't a member of her family, immediately she falls under suspicion of adultery and she can be punished very vehemently for stepping out of line, even though the conversation might have been entirely innocent. And in other parts of the country, um, women's roles are portrayed in the way that they behave when men are present. Look at this picture that I took when I was in northern Uganda. The woman in the picture is actually a very successful businesswoman. She's a farmer. She has farmed for many years. Um, her farm is well known in the area. She supplies produce to neighbourhoods and villages right around. But as soon as we show up, because my host is a man, she drops to her knees and offers her hand to be shaken. Now, why does she do that? It seems a very strange way to behave for us as Westerners. And she does it because she wants to acknowledge his superiority. She wants to show deference towards a man because she is only a woman and because therefore she has no right to stand side by side with this man and shake his hand. It's interesting how that happens in terms of women's work in many parts of the world. Here are two more photographs taken in another African country where women are doing the work um, of uh, many, many women do. Uh, this woman, these women are actually putting grain in sacks, as you can see. It's during the end of a famine and grain has been supplied in a warehouse and the men are supervising, <laughs> which means they're largely standing around chatting to one another whilst the women do the work. And notice how interesting it is that women's two roles, two fundamental roles are not competing with each other, but they're joining each other in the way that women's work is done. So the women are putting grain in the sacks, but also they're carrying babies on their back or their front as they're doing that work. Domesticity and domestic work alongside other kinds of work go hand in hand for most of these women. And then these other two photographs. Here the woman is carrying a weight on her head that's probably equivalent almost to her own weight. And then when we see her from the back, we see that she's also carrying a baby on her back. So patriarchal societies, which are male dominant, which have very got strong rules for the way women work, and where subordination or submission is built into their roles as women, are not at all unusual. And they do operate in many different societies and sometimes, of course, in very violent ways, not least in our own society, where domestic violence is one of the scourges on the society that we live in. And what's that about other than men exercising power, even in the most intimate relationships, whether you know the figures, but there are now more than two women every week in the United Kingdom who are killed by their partners or their husbands. Well, there's lots of uh, information about that issue and lots of other issues about violence against women in a book I wrote some years ago called Scars Across Humanity. And it's written as a Christian, trying to rally Christians around to looking at what we should be doing in response to these misguided and misleading understandings of women that lead to their violation and often to their death. And it's very important to recognise that, um, as we do at the end of this book, that all religions play into this in some way or another. But whether we're justified 
in ever arguing that the Bible gives us permission or credibility to the idea that women are in any way inferior or in any way subordinate to the extent that they can be violated um, is a very, very important issue. If we're really claiming that the biblical view of women eventually leads to their harm and to their um, eradication in, some, in areas of society, we are making very, very serious allegations which have to be looked into. And that's why I think it's very important for us to look at Women in Patriarchal Societies, the title of this seminar. Because my argument is, when we start to look at the Bible carefully, we realise that it's very different. It's a whole message is very different from the one that's purported to be there, justifying these atrocities committed against women. So what is the Bible? Let's start from scratch. Let's start from the rock bottom. The Bible is God's revelation to us. But it's not just a book, and it's not even just two books written um, as the Old and New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. It's a whole library, a compendium of books in many different forms and genres of literature. Some of it's prophecy, some of it's song, some of it's proverbs, some of it's history, some of it's war history or war annals, some of it's genealogies, uh, quite a lot of it is letters in the New Testament, some of it's biography, the Gospels and so on, some of it's dream analysis, until there's layers and layers of different kinds of literature built into the scriptures, and they all have their different hermeneutics, different ways of approaching them and understanding them, but they're all together the single word of God. It's God's revelation to us about who we are and who God is and how we relate together with God. So it's the story of our creation by God, our fall into sin, and the, the, the way in which sin dogs our lives in every era and every history of society. And it's also about the promise of redemption in the Hebrew scriptures through the prophets and the other areas of the scriptures pointing to Jesus who will come and whose life, death and resurrection restore us to God. So we have our sins forgiven and we have the first taste of redemptive living. But there is one area where those critics of the Bible have got it right. And it's when they say that the biblical text is given into patriarchal societies, because it was. Israel was a very patriarchal society, and so were its neighbours on every area of its borders. And the patriarchy of society was vested in the elders, the tribal leaders, the patriarchs. <laughs> That's where we get the word from, of course. It was the male elders, the male rule, that dominated the way in which people saw things. And the lives of women were restricted uh, and they were scheduled very much within a patriarchal compass. They were domestic predominantly. Um, they were there to bring the next generation, to teach the next generation and to actually support the whole work of Israel. But there were women in that society, in all of those societies as the years evolved, who were anything but submissive or subordinate. There were outstanding leaders in Israel. Some of them were judges, some were prophets, some held court on the palm trees, some were midwives, others were women with um, uh, real spiritual gifts that could discern situations and change them on their heads. And they were all celebrated in the Hebrew scriptures. And in a book I wrote recently, which was due to be launched at Spring Harvest, um, and it's called Women in a Patriarchal Society, in women in the patriarchal world, it looks like this. Um, it's not out yet, <laughs> but I hope you might still buy it when it comes out. And I look at um, 25 women from the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. Well, 25 cases and stories. In fact, it includes 30 women in all, because some of these women work in tandem with other women. And the unfolding story in the Old Testament alone is one of exciting innovation, one of exciting insights, and one of exciting celebrations of women's gifts and talents, and their necessity, their incredible leadership for Israel at a time that they were involved in. There's 400 years between the last writing of the Old Testament and the first writings of the New Testament. But those 400 years didn't eradicate patriarchy. Certainly, in the New Testament, the power of the tribes of Israel has diminished. And much of the New Testament is about people in exile, uh, the Jews in exile, but also Christians in exile, as the movement in the New Testament goes on. 
Because meanwhile, we've had these big empires. We've had the Greek Empire, we have the Roman Empire, and the invasion of Palestine, and now the rule of Rome. And so patriarchy is just there, but it's shifted. Its nature has changed. It's not just vested in the tribes of Israel now, but it's also vested in the rulers of Rome. Roman patriarchal society is very, very powerful indeed, and it has very strong schedules as to where women behave and where women belong. And so in this new kind of patriarchy, you have the synagogues, you have the scribes and the Pharisees who didn't exist in the Old Testament, all adding their tuppence to women's lot and women's schedules, and the whole package is quite a formidable one. But there too, you have stories of amazing women. But these stories have something different from the stories in the Old Testament. And that is many of them occur in the Gospels, and many of them occur in relation to the life of Jesus. And it's when you look at the relationship between Jesus and these women that the penny really begins to drop in an amazing way. Because woman after woman, he celebrates, he affirms, he endorses, he actually blesses, um, in spite or often because they are women. And he calls other people to do likewise, and he rebukes other people for actually scorning them or for seeing them wrongly. And it's not just powerful women that Jesus endorses. In fact, it's very ordinary women, women who um, are doing ordinary things like mothering people, women who are suffering, struggling women, women who are struggling with illness, like the woman who has got a hemorrhage, a bleeding problem, um, which she can't get rid of. And Jesus steps into the breach and the whole new era begins for her. And then even women who are despised by society. Um, Samaritan woman who has been much married, not because incidentally, um, <laughs> as I've often heard preached, she was a very sexually active woman and was always dissatisfied with the bloke she married, so she moved on to someone else. <laughs> that's a ridiculous understanding of the story. Really, that story is about a woman who has been rejected by men because in those days, uh, Samaritan men could divorce their wives, but Samaritan women could not divorce their husbands. And so far from being a restless woman, she was a discarded woman. And yet Jesus meets her um, at the well. Jesus is actually very needy at the well. He's there because he's tired. They've had a long journey. His disciples have gone into town to buy food. And it's noon, so it's bakingly hot, and he's thirsty. So tired and hungry and thirsty, Jesus is sitting there at the well. And along comes this woman and he asks her for a drink. And that in itself is mind-blowing. Decades, generations of animosity between Jews and Samaritans and, of course, the protocol about gender. And Jesus cuts right through it and asks her for a drink. And it's the woman, the Samaritan woman, who has to remind him of the protocols that Jews don't have in dealings with Samaritans, and she knows the ablution laws, and he's got no way of cleaning the vessel before she take, he takes the drink from her, and so on. And what follows from that remark is Jesus identifying this woman's deep spiritual need. His need is physical, it's for water, he's thirsty. Her need is spiritual, but he can fill that need with spiritual water, with water that will well into eternal life. The conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman is actually one of the most detailed in the scriptures. It's quite amazing. He covers not only identifying her, locating her history, talking about her marriages, but also politics, looking at the way in which Jews and Samaritans have disagreed on the nature of worship and the place of worship. She, she, Jesus is asked to adjudicate by the woman, where is the worship to be located? Should it be in the temple or on the mountain? Are the Jews right or are the Samaritans right? And Jesus throws the whole debate open and over and says, frankly, it doesn't matter where we worship. What matters is how we worship, because God is spirit and we have to worship God in spirit and truth. It's the most extraordinary uh, encounter. And the woman begins to realize that this is more than a prophet. This is actually the Messiah. And then Jesus discloses himself as the, the books, Messiah to her. The, the books are right here. Oh, back precious. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. My book's come. <laughs> and that was bought by Alan. <laughs>
So the, the whole issue then of the Samaritan woman and Jesus has to be understood in the context of the culture, of the patriarchy of the society, of Jesus' need at the time, but also the Samaritans were in a much greater need. And of course, she then becomes the first evangelist. She rushes off back to her own people, the people she's been trying to avoid, and actually brings them to encounter Jesus for themselves. And it's interesting too how even the disciples aren't going to ask her, why are you talking with a woman? Because they know that something is going on of great depth in that discussion. I want you to look at these four pictures, um, which actually are paintings of that encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. I find them very interesting, and I wonder if you will too. Let's look at picture number one. What does this say about the story? Well, it says Jesus is the dominant character. He's really rather macho. He's a very dominant male. He's standing up stridently. He's actually got one foot in a very strident position on the wall, and she's sitting on the wall. He's instructing her. His body language is that of a teacher, of an instructor, and she is there quite demurely listening to her. Is that a very good depiction of the story that you read in John 4? Well, let's look at the next one. In this picture, Jesus is at least sitting down and holding really rather a silly little cup, <laughs> which indicates that he has needs. There were no needs in the first picture. There was nothing to suggest that Jesus was asking anything of the woman in the first picture. But here, at least, he's asking for a drink, uh, at least implicitly in the way in which it's portrayed. But she, what's she doing? She's not sitting anymore. She's now kneeling or on the floor. So again, you get that subservience position where the woman is down, Jesus is up, and Jesus is instructing her again or teaching her, albeit in a very benign way. The third picture is really quite different. Here the woman is approaching the well. And she's in for a surprise because she's come on her own at noon, hoping that there's going to be nobody around. She doesn't want to come with her neighbours. She is a discarded woman. Um, she doesn't have neighbours that she can fraternise with because they all suspect her. So she's coming on her own and suddenly she sees a man on the wall waiting for her. And already you see from Jesus' body language there that he's asking her for a drink. So you see something of the vulnerability of Jesus in this picture. And actually, it's a much truer version of the story that we read in John 4. And then we go to the final picture. And here you get the full vulnerability of Jesus. He's almost slumped. He's not even in a very accurate body posture. There's nothing strident about him at all. He's just needy. And the woman is standing, ready to draw the water. And you can see already she's quite a sassy woman. Now, which of those four paintings more accurately gives us an insight into what the Bible story says about women, and particularly what the Bible story says about that woman? Well, it's the last two, and possibly the last one of all. The first two don't. They tell an inaccurate picture because they presented their understanding of the relationship between women and men, and they read it into the biblical text, and they read it into that very story and therefore they've prejudiced, they've biased our understanding of what was going on in that encounter. And we have to be very careful not to do that whenever we're looking at the scriptures, not to bring our own prejudice, our own preconceptions, our own assumptions about the relationship between men and women, and then read them back into the biblical text, because by and large, they're not there. I want to finish this seminar by just reading you a, a wee snippet from the beginning, um, one, of the first, one of the first stories I start with, which is the story of the Hebrew midwives. I call this chapter, Call the Midwives, and I'd just like you to give, to give you a little uh, snippet of, uh, of how the book unfolds when it addresses some of the issues for these women. Just imagine you're a midwife, committed to helping women through a safe labour and delivering a healthy baby. It's a job you love. And it gives you great satisfaction to be there at the beginnings of new life. Then, an unexpected order come down, comes down from the highest political authority that all midwives have to practice selective abortion. Close to the end of the birth process, and as soon as the genitals are identified, you must eliminate all babies of the wrong sex 
and the wrong ethnicity. No choice of conscience is offered, no mediating circumstances, and the penalty for disobeying the order is likely to be severe. It could be disqualification, imprisonment, or possibly even death. You stare at the document that's been delivered to you personally. Your name is on the order. You have no friends in high places who can advise you. How would you respond? This was exactly the dilemma faced by Shifa and Pua, two Hebrew midwives in Exodus 1. They were part of a huge Jewish population living in Egypt. By this period, the fertility rate amongst the Hebrew women was high and the two midwives had their hands full of babies. The edict from on high must have come as a very unpleasant shock. With new mums already going into labour, however were they going to respond? There is, of course, a story. The Jewish presence in Egypt had started with Joseph hundreds of years before. Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers, but ended up as a key official in Pharaoh's Egyptian court because of his spiritual discernment of dreams. When he foretold of an impending long famine, Pharaoh gave him the job of implementing his clear, far-sighted policies for coping with it. The confidence of Pharaoh was justified. But Joseph effectively saved Egypt's population from starvation. Yet famine rapidly spread elsewhere, and Joseph's family came to Egypt for food to be followed by many more from Canaan. The Israelites stayed. They grew in number. They settled down as permanent residents of Egypt. Now, hundreds of years later, Joseph had been long forgotten and the harsh regime saw the size of the immigrant Jewish population as a threat. The current pharaoh, possibly Ramesses II, looked over his shoulder to Egypt's many enemies beyond their borders and feared the Israelites might eventually form some alliance with others against him. So he began to curtail their effectiveness. He forced them into slave labour, putting them under brutal taskmasters, weakening their spirits, making their lives a general misery. Oppression followed oppression, but still the Hebrew people multiplied. Still the midwives were kept busy. Pharaoh then stepped back and decided on a more drastic remedy. It seemed the obvious one. Cut down the birth rate of this growing ethnic minority in Egypt. In particular, he decided on the elimination of boy babies. They could allow the girls to live. They were always useful as wives or concubines for the Egyptians, but boys would provide a potential fighting force the Israelites. The cull of male babies, before they even took their first breath, would ensure that the whole population would eventually dwindle and the threat be removed. The order was thus given to instruct all midwives that Hebrew babies were not to be born. Shifra and Pua may not have been expecting this and would not have known who to turn to for advice. They had no economic or political power. They were not wealthy or well-connected in professional hierarchies. They simply helped other Jewish women give birth. Effectively, they were in a subservient position to a sub subservient people. Yet despite all of this, they showed no sign of being cowed by the edict. They had minds of their own. They also had strong beliefs and values which stemmed from their Jewish faith. The story tells us that they feared God more than they feared the king of Egypt. And fear here means dread, uh, means reverence rather than dread. It was this fear and their own moral fibre that enabled them to enter into what was effectively a high stakes power play with the king of the ruling nation. They simply ignored the order. And you have to read the rest of it. The story goes on and the outcome is very, very interesting. Women in the Bible um, are amazing. And this book I've written is actually choosing not all the women in the Bible because there are many, many more that I haven't investigated or engaged with in this particular uh, volume. I've chosen women who had challenges to face, like those two Hebrew midwives, 
women who had decisions to make, women who actually were grappling with situations about being women in patriarchal societies and had to make decisions that most of us would never in a million years ever have to make. And the story that the Bible unfolds in each of these cases is a story of faith in God, of ultimate commitment to the truth and to the right way of living, and a defiance of even the most atrocious and the most powerful enemy. So I recommend the book to you, but even more, I recommend the Word of God. I invite you to read these stories for themselves in the biblical text as it unfolds. And I'd love it if you could share with me this conviction that when we read the Bible carefully and properly, in its full complement, in its full narrative, we see something very different about women than we see even in the most patriarchal society on earth. We see God's approbation. We see God's empowering. We see God's love. We see God's judgment on injustice. And most of all, we see Jesus' liberation so that we can walk this earth with power, with inspiration, with comfort and with love because of who we are and our identity is in Christ. God bless you. Have a lovely spring harvest. Bye now. <laughs>